Good morning, welcome to EduSat Network. Friend, today we are going to discuss the tribal and folk art in India, the changing landscape. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio eminent personality Dr. A.K. Das. He is a former professor of museology in National Museum Institute and presently director of Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial New Delhi. And Dr. Das has written a number of books, a few books I would like to tell you, uh, Tribal Art and Culture, uh, Tribal Art and Craft, Museography for Ethnocultural uh, Material, and other doc documentation of folk and tribal art in India. So, on your behalf, I welcome him for that lecture on this very topic, Tribal and Folk Art, Changing Landscape. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, today's topic is uh, Tribal and Folk Art in changing cultural landscape of India. Now, uh, there are lots of misconceptions about the, uh, the tribal or the folk art in India. Many people ask, what is tribal art? What is this art? Is it uh, really the art as we conceived uh, in our day-to-day -day life? Yeah. And uh, many people, when they go to some museum or some uh, emporium and where they encounter uh, some of the tribal art object, you know, and uh, they find it difficult uh, whether it is an art or a craft. Uh, many times it is, you know, confused with the craft, but uh, it is important that uh, there are many uh, objects in the, uh, which we find among these people. Uh, they definitely are, uh, you know, as important as any form of art, whether it is classical or modern. And uh, today uh, I would like to discuss about the very significance of this art in India and its continuity, how it is uh, facing uh, the changes of time. Uh, that is what I am going to discuss in this lecture. Now, as you know, the India is a vast country and with you know diverse ecological zones and people you know living in diverse um, environment and adapting to that environment you know with uh, uh, different way of life and this is very important for us when we talk about the tribal art in India. Uh, now you see. Uh, there are the high altitude areas of Himalaya, you know, in the north, and where we have a limited number of tribal groups like the Gaddis or the Bhutias, you know, like that. And uh, there are, um, in the eastern Himalaya, we have uh, a number of tribes like the Monpas and Sardukbens, and then Jakarings and, uh, you know, Membas like that. Then you, when you come down from uh, the high altitude of uh, the Himalaya and uh, when you come down to the river plain, the river valley, the Gangetic plains, you know, the vast Gangetic plains. And this is the place where we have, uh, we don't have much uh, tribe except one or two. Uh, and then as you go down south, we come to the Vindhya uh, hill area, then to the plateau region of South India. And this is one of the very important place for the tribal concept. We have a large number of tribal groups in, in the central India. And uh, there are more than 150 tribal groups in this. And this area consists of not only Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, but also part of Bihar, part of Bengal, part of Odisha, and part of Andhra Pradesh, and a part of uh, Maharashtra. You know, it's a vast area and we have very significant tribe like the Gond, who are well known in the field of art today. We have uh, the Muria, Maria, Vatra, Dorla, like that, many. It's not possible to count. And so, now uh, this is, a, and then down the south in the coastal area, huh, uh, we have um, a number of tribal group, but not much. And as we go, uh, towards northeast, and the northeast is now consisting of about uh, um, eight uh, um, states, and this is another major concentration of the tribal people. And here we find another, uh, you know, near about 100 tribal groups, 
and uh, then some of the tribes are very famous and uh, much uh, and a number of works have been done uh, by uh, by many anthropologists and other art historians in this area and we have the famous tribes like the nagas we have the uh, the bodos we have the um, the kacharis we have the um, the Tiwa, and then we have um, a number of um, hill tribes like the Karbis or the Dimasas, you know, like the many tribes and groups. Now, in this tribal situation, you see uh, the people living in the high altitude areas of Himalayas, uh, and they are uh, mostly cattle breeders, and they are almost nomadic, moving from place to place. So their art is, uh, you know, concentrated in their day-to-day -day economic life. As we come down to the central India where we have lots of tribal groups, and here we find the agriculturists. And they have, uh, you know, uh, shifting cultivation practice, and also some of them practice wet rice cultivation. And these people, they have uh, some leisure time, and during the leisure time, uh, they engage themselves in preparing a number of crops objects, some of which are definitely the art objects. So here we find uh, a large number of art and crafts objects uh, consisting of uh, you know different material. We will come to that later on. And as we go uh, to the northeast, again it's a hilly area, and uh, shifting cultivation is practiced. Most of the people are uh, cultivators, shifting cultivators, and these people also. Uh, have some leisure time to work on certain crops, especially in this area, the, the basketry, which is very famous because the bamboo work, which is very famous. In, and a large number of bamboo objects, you know, could be considered as the tribal art. <coughs> and then uh, you see um, in the Bay of Bengal, uh, this is the uh, Northeast India, the hilly area. Uh, in this TPT, you can see the, the tribal habitat, which is green and you see cloudy and a beautiful landscape. Now, in the Bay Island, it's the Bay of Bengal, we have the Andaman and Nicobar Island. And this island, again, we have a number of minor number of tribes. And these tribes um, are very important for us because they are of Negrito uh, race. And here we have the tribes like Onges and uh, Jarwas, Sentinelis, and the Great Andamanis. Now, uh, these are actually hunter-gatherers. They uh, they don't have agriculture. They don't know anything about agriculture. They don't know anything about cattle breeding. And they are just hunter-gatherers, and they are nomadic. They move from place to place in search of games, in search of forest products on which they subsist. So uh, these people, they uh, are busy the, uh, the whole year and the whole day in search of their food. And so here we find a very limited number of um, craft practices here. Most of these people, you will find that they um, use uh, the bows and arrows, you know, for hunting. And at times they use a digging stick, a very simple digging stick for digging roots and tubers in the jungle. Then these people also use a number of, uh, you know, sea, um, animals, uh, you know, like uh, the seashells, you know, which is used by them for their household article. So here we, what we find, uh, the art practice is very limited. I will come to that later on. Now, uh, as I told you that the, the, the tribal people, uh, they live in different ecological niches and because of them, they have a different type of uh, creativity and, and a different type of art uh, material, you know. And 
I can uh, give you a list of uh, the, 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 the cultural material that could be uh, considered as uh, the form of tribal art. Now, among the tribes, what we find, the materials used by them is very interesting. They use kind of material like, uh, uh, like clay uh, or art. They use minerals, bamboo and cane, bamboo, cane and reed. They use wood. They use bone, ivory, plume, and some other uh, material, you know, of uh, uh, animals like birds. Ah, and that then they have, they are using leather, skin, and fur. And some of the types, very limited in number, use metal. So they have some kind of metal products. And finally, uh, it is the human body, which is uh, one of the unusual canvas for expression of tribal art. And these are um, the, 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 the limitation of the material here, but these materials are locally available and uh, the tribal people, they uh, get this material from their local environment and they use them for a different type of uh, art activity. Now art forms, you know the, what are the art forms among the tribal groups? That is uh, very important for us. Uh, now it is very unusual because the tri art forms, uh, when you talk about the art forms among the tribal, it is um, not like uh, the, the, the art for art's sake as we see uh, in the modern art or our classical art where you have stone sculptures or you have the miniature paintings where you have bronze statues, you know, like that. And in case of uh, the tribal people, the art objects are day-to-day -day metal. They are functional, they are, they are not for art for art's sake. They're just functional. They are the objects of everyday use. There can be a basket woven of uh, bamboo or cane strip. There can be a textile fabric woven of cotton or other uh, vegetative fabric uh, in the very simple loin loom. And there can be a number of clay products like some kind of pottery, some kind of terracotta objects, you know, out of the clay, which is locally available. Then you have a number of wooden artifacts, you know, like wood carvings or engravings, you know, uh, from uh, the locally available wood, uh, which they collect from the jungle and use it. And then there are uh, objects like um, jewelries, the ornaments, you know, this, these are very interesting uh, area. The, the tribal ornaments, which vary from place to place. We have different type of uh, bead jewelries, which you find among the tribal people of Northeast India. And we have uh, different type of metal jewelries in Central India. And we have a very interesting type of jewelry which we find in Urissa. The, the, it, is, it is the clay or it is the terracotta. By using terracotta, you know, beads with paints and all, they make jewelry like necklaces, you know. So, and again, if going back to the Northeast India, there are unusual material used for the ornamentation, like the seeds of certain trees, like if you, See, among the Konyak Naga, they wear a kind of uh, earplug, you know, uh, which is uh, made out of a seed called the Kaurimoni. Uh, it's a Kaurimoni red color seed, you know, and this seed is collected from the jungle, and then they use it by a kind of gum, you know, with the, the gum they make a kind of uh, ear plug and which is used by male. It's, it's a male ornament. 
So the seed, it is uh, in one of the uh, very interesting item which we find uh, in the uh, tribal art. And then the metallurgy, the metallurgy, especially the, you know, the Dokra art, which we find in Central India, in Eastern India. And in the Dokra is a lost wax process, which is a very uh, uh, a simple type of metallurgy. And this lost wax process uh, is called Dokra. Uh, and we have uh, Dokra images uh, in Bastar in Madhya Pradesh, which are used by the tribal people as votive objects. We have the Dokra image in Urissa, used by tribes like the uh, cones, you know, where they make uh, certain objects. Some of them are votive, but some of them are very secular, profane. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the metal object. And then comes to the body and face painting and tattooing. This is another uh, form of art we find, the body and face painting. Uh, uh, body and face painting we find um, among the Onges and the Sentinelis and the, the Andaman tribes, actually. And here uh, they use two different type of uh, ochre uh, locally available. It's a kind of red ochre and a white ochre. And while painting their face and the body, they make some kind of uh, patterns. Uh, now, the tattooing. The tattooing is uh, one of the important uh, art forms that is found all over India, from Central India to Northeast to South India, and even it is in the uh, high altitude mountain area of uh, Himalayas. So the tattooing uh, and is a kind of practice which has socio and religious significance. Among the uh, one chose or the Konyak Nagas, the tattooing done on a nomen, you see, uh, can, uh, can be read, you know, the, the entire life from uh, her birth to uh, her uh, reaching puberty and her marriage and giving birth to a child like that. All these are symbolized in the tattoo marks, which is done on the uh, body of the woman. And it starts from the neck to the chest to the thighs and then the, uh, the leg, you know, the calf muscle where they do this tattooing. So the tattooing is another uh, important socio religious uh, soci uh, important socio religious uh, has socio religious significance like, and the uh, the textile weaving which is um, uh, uh, a craft actually among these people but some of these textiles they are unusually made with beautiful color composition with motifs and designs, especially in the Northeast India. Northeast India is rich in textile uh, tradition. Now, uh, if you go among the Nagas, they have the, every Naga house, the young women, they uh, work with their own uh, cards and shawls, you know, of different color composition with different uh, designs and patterns. Now here, uh, the color composition and designs and patterns are not just for aesthetic, but it has a social significance. Like one can identify a Naga, you know, man or woman looking at the skirt or the sole. The, the, uh, the, the skirt or the sole will give the identity of the Naga, the name of the group uh, and the clan to which he belongs, even the village to which, from which he comes. From the soul, one can read 
the entire identity of uh, the person. So here again, the social significance lies with this uh, uh, art. Then the um, textile tradition is also um, important uh, because it is a very important craft and it has economic significance among the tribals and some of the tribal people uh, they prepare uh, beautiful fabrics which are being used uh, by non tribal people you know in their everyday life if you go to rajasthan or if you go to gujarat uh, and maharashtra there are many tribal people who make uh, fabrics which are uh, used by the uh, non tribal people you know for their some kind of ceremonies and rituals that is very important now the bamboo craft the bamboo craft especially the basketry the again uh, the basketry is all, all india um, it has all india manifestation we find baskets among the tribes of the central india we find baskets among the tribes of the andaman and nicobar island we have the basketry uh, in uh, eastern indian tribes like uh, the tribes in Urissa or in Bengal or in Bihar. And for the Northeast, the basketry or the bamboo work is, is a very prominent craft. Actually, entire Northeast, you know, uh, can be called a region of bamboo culture. But here, the bamboo is not only used for their uh, basket making, it is used for many things like the, the bamboo is also used as food, bamboo is also used for making household utensils, bamboo is used for, used for making houses, bamboo is used for making bridges to span river, bamboo is used as ritual objects, you know, and then uh, as we see among the Adis of Arunachal Pradesh where bamboo savings are done in such a manner you know, that, as that gives uh, the impression of a kind of effigy. You know? uh, so this effigy is, is a kind of local deity actually. So the bamboo, so this entire notice is, is a region of bamboo culture and the bamboo products are uh, uh, <coughs> bamboo products are uh, you know, completely uh, an object of art. You know, and it, and if you see the actually the the this, the uh, number of baskets in museums, especially in the Northeast Indian museums, the beauty of these baskets in the shapes and the textures and the structural ornamentation, it make it an object of art. Actually, it's a, definitely a beautiful thing. So. Uh, and the, this is about the basketry and the bamboo uh, work which uh, we find all over India and the Northeast India which is the most uh, significant area for, for this. And we have um, then finally uh, the painting tradition among the tribal groups, you know. And this painting tradition is concentrated in India in Central India, Eastern India, and Western India. In the West, especially in this Gujarat and Rajasthan, we have uh, some kind of house wall decorations or house wall paintings. And here we have two examples which are uh, well known. One is the Pithora painting, it's called Pithora among the Ratua tribe of South Gujarat. The Pithora painting among the Ratua tribes of South Gujarat. And here this Pithora painting is painted on the house wall. This is completely a uh, sacred painting actually. When um, uh, some, uh, some, some persons in the, in the village, you know, 
his wish is fulfilled or he constructs a new house. So it is, uh, you know, the, the, the duty of the, the person to have a painting, Pitora painting done uh, inside uh, his house. And for that, uh, you know, he invites the priest and the artist who will make this and the people who will sing and dance and some more people, some women who will come and cook and so this is a household art but it becomes a kind of celebration in the village, the entire village participates. The artists, they do the painting, you know, on the wall and the priests, they, he do the rituals and the, uh, the dancers and singers, they sing and dance during the process and the other women folk, they cook food so that um, they serve food to food and drinks to the people participating in that uh, sacred act. And so this is the, the Pitora painting, this is about Pitora painting. <coughs> and another painting in the Western India it comes from the uh, Rajasthan. And among the Minas, actually, there's a group of tribe called Mina in Rajasthan. And in the Mina village, again, it is a house wall decoration, which is called Mandana painting. The Mandana painting is done on the house wall. Actually, the house wall is uh, uh, smeared with uh, kind of red ochre, you know. And on that, they use uh, some white ochre to make uh, a painting. And these paintings, are um, kind of floral uh, motifs, you know, and, and stylistically done by the women folk, the Mina women, they do this. And this is done on two important occasions. One is the, the, during the Diwali time, they have to decorate their uh, house walls with Mandana painting and during marriage ceremony. In the marriage ceremony, they have to uh, do this painting. Hmm? Uh, as a part of the marriage celebration. So the Mandana painting, these are the two uh, paintings which we find, tribal paintings, find in the Western India. And then if we come to the Central India, so we have, <coughs> you know, most important is the Warli. The Warlis are a tribe in Maharashtra, you know, and the Warli paintings are now uh, considered to be uh, tourist art because uh, this art is now available, you know, uh, in any emporium or any souvenir shop in the big cities. Warli art, the, the, the paintings of the Warlis, initially these are the sacred paintings. These are actually the painting done in a, um, in a particular uh, ritual, actually. And the ritual is performed and the painting is done, especially the paintings like the, the image of the corn god, which is a fertility light actually, and that fertility light, they will, they will paint the image of the corn god on the wall and do the ritual. And this actually um, continued, for, and this was actually done by women folk. But later on, even, even in today's time, you know, the, the men folk has taken over and uh, they started uh, painting these uh, forms, you know, on canvas, or you know, it may be paper or, or some other, you know, like. And these are now available in the market. So now uh, the paintings have come, uh, has has, you know, travelled from the house wall to the market. Now, this is a very uh, interesting um, uh, development and. This is good also because this will uh, help in survival of this art, which uh, in many parts of India, which has already gone into oblivion. Now, uh, <coughs> this is about the worldly painting. And then come to another uh, group of tribe in Madhya Pradesh, the Gond. The Gond painting, again, it is very important and interesting. The Gond painting, again, a ritual painting. It is done on the house wall. It was done by women folk. Again, it's a woman folk, they done and uh, during certain rituals, and then some of this painting, you know, um, 
is attributed to a number of uh, local deities, you know, like that. But this painting again, you know, are taken over by the man folk, and they have now commercialized this art. So now Gon painting has now internationally known, you know, and we have the uh, artists like Sadasip, Masse, and all who are internationally known. And here, what they have done, they have kept the tribal uh, stamp, you know, in form of the motif or the theme of the art, and they are using commercial uh, colors, you know, and they have introduced certain uh, expressive elements into it and make it uh, a very exotic, exotic type of, uh, you know, um, art, you know, and the expression is, um, you know, just like any other modern art, you know. So, the, the Gon painting now um, is very, it will not be, uh, you know, um, possible to call it tribal art, but it is something like a modern art. Because these paintings are now sold for lakhs of rupees, you know, like they are just like, but yet these are, they have the Gon uh, stamp on it. So, we may call it, yes, Gon commercial art or Gon tourist art. So these are the gone tourist art we can call them. Then comes the uh, the paintings. You go down to um, Bengal and the Bihar. You know where we have the santals, and the santals. You know among the santals we have the painting tradition, which is also uh, not very old, but they, they have the painting tradition called. The, these are called the Potochitras, but they have actually copied it from the Bengali Potochitra cards, you know, but they have their own uh, style and they have their own theme, you know, and the Santal Potochitras are of two types. One is called Jodupat or Soksudan Pot and the Potochitra. <coughs> Potochitra is, you know, is made in, uh, in a th the theme is actually uh, the the creation of uh, life, actually, that is the, based on the creation of life, and the style is, uh, you know, again uh, the same as we find in the households of the Santal people. Actually, in the Santal household, you have these paintings beautifully done, and the same thing has now come to the canvas, and in the canvas, they make it more uh, complex. Uh, Themes like the uh, origin of the santals or the creation meat, like that. I mean, and the Sakshudan pot. The Sakshudan pot is again a kind of uh, ritualistic. But here, a person, he, if he, in his lifetime, he may, you know, um, donate his eye, you know, and and that is to commemorate that, so they make the Sakshudan pot. These are the paintings, you know, of the person, actually, who has donated the eye, you know, or who has, who is thinking of donating the eye. So these are very interesting uh, forms of painting. And <coughs> so the, the, the painting tradition among the tribe, I would like to call it the highest form of art among the tribes. And here, uh, both the secular as well as sacred type of paintings are available, as we have seen, the Pitora painting, completely sacred, or the Warli painting, which was sacred. Now, the Gon painting, which are completely secular, commercial. We have this, the, the Potochitros, or the your Sakshudan pot, which are again uh, sacred, you know, like that. So uh, this is the the painting tradition. Now uh, this is uh, in nutshell the, the 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 form of tribal art and its significance, you know. The question now there are many other questions which. Uh, need to be discussed 
uh, in terms of the, the tribal art. Now, the tribal art or the tribal or folk art is not considered as one of the important area of uh, study when we talk about the history of art, the subject history of art. In the history of art, the, their, their main concern is the classical art, the ancient art. Their main concern is about the, the modern art, our main concern about the history of art. Here there is no scope for tribal and folk art because the historians or the art historians, they consider that the tribal and folk art is not art but they are the craft. So here a very difficult question whether it is craft or whether it is art, uh, you know, how to um, differentiate because it, it is the craft and because of the skill of the craftsman, he beautifies an object and that object because of its shape, because of its texture, because of its decorations, because of its paintings, you know, many art is, it becomes beautiful. So it is a crafts object and since there is beauty inherent in it, it becomes an art object. Of course, there may not be uh, any history uh, to these objects, but there is the significance of culture in it. But if the culture is uh, to be studied, you know, it is very important that we have to take into consideration the, the art objects or the crafts object which has, you know, the beauty inherent in it. So this is uh, one of the uh, important question which comes from time to whether it should be included in the history of art or not. Another question is, uh, that is very important, that is about intellectual property right. The intellectual property right uh, in respect of the tribal and folk art um, is, uh, is a very uh, delicate issue because the tribal and folk art is a collective expression. It is not individualistic. It's a, like if we take, for example, uh, Wally painting uh, or the or the the Pitora painting, where the you know the there are entire village participate when the painting is done. Now in that case, if there is an intellectual property right. So that property right should be given to the tribe itself, entire tribe, not individual. But the, the, as per the law, it is the individual, you know, to whom you can give the intellectual property right. So, uh, because many of these art forms are now being, uh, you know, used by non-tribal, you know, for commercial purposes. And, and sometimes uh, um, it has been seen that uh, the people, uh, people from outside, even from outside India also, they come and they commission uh, a tribal artist, you know, for a particular type of artwork and they take this painting and, you know, they sell it in the market in their name or in some other like that and they pay a small amount to the art and the artist remains anonymous. Nobody knows that who has done that painting but that painting is sold uh, you know in a large amount of money outside India or even in India also this is happening. So here it is a very important that our individual artists should get this intellectual property right so that they can get some kind of a monetary benefit or economic benefit out of their uh, artwork. That is one of the problem <coughs> we are facing in respect of this uh, tribal and the folk art in India. The another thing is that uh, in this connection, you see the in the Indian Antiquities and Art Treasure Act, you know, which is uh, promulgated by the Archaeological Survey of India. 
So, there are uh, objects you know which are 100 years old considered to be the antiquities and there are manuscripts and the books 75 years old they are also considered to be the antiquities that is ok. But there is another uh, element which is called the art treasure. Now, art treasure here is uh, is not clearly defined, but the art treasure uh, as, as far uh, the, the development which we see in recent time like the the minister government of India has declared uh, the paintings done by nine master artists you know who are dead actually who are dead after their death government has declared that these are the art treasures and as a by gadget notification. So, those art treasures become antiquities actually this we you cannot take these objects out of the country and sell it. So, the art treasure and we have lots of beautiful uh, tribal and folk art objects you know and these are uh, yet to be declared as art treasure. So, this is very important that this art treasure uh, provision in this act it should also include the tribal and folk art which deserves to be the art treasure of this country. So, um, so this is uh, some of the problems um, which um, we are facing in the present time and uh, finally, I would like to uh, come down to the uh, you know uh, an important issue that is the art in this changing situation, the tribal and folk art in this changing situation. So, there is a great uh, change that is coming up in the tribal and folk uh, life in this country uh, because of uh, globalization, because of modernization, because of many other things economic development, socio economic development and these uh, <coughs> these changes you know are doing two uh, important um, thing one is we can call it very positive for the survival of the tribal and folk art, other is detrimental to it. Um, like if we consider the, the gond, modern gond paintings you know done by this Sadasi Hasen, uh, uh, Zargan Syam Singh and all. This is a very positive development here. The art has come out of the village and it has uh, spread all over the country and it has gone out of the country to internationally it became internationally known. And so, and following uh, Jargon Syam Singh many Gond artists now practicing this art and their art forms and they are just at par like the Madhubani painting in Bihar where the Madhubani painting was once it was just in the uh, Niputel chamber called Khobar Ghar done by the women. Uh, folk you know for marriage ritual. Now, that has come out of the Nupital's chamber or the Kobargar and it is done on canvas and done by man folk and then a, a number of uh, artists who have become nationally and internationally famous because of and the same thing is happening among the uh, Gond painting and this is a very and a positive thing. And uh, finally, the, the, the certain art form like the there are art forms connected with the Naga people, the, they have this head hunting uh, cult. You know the, the with the head hunting uh, which is banned sometimes in 60s you know and the and many of the art forms connected with these particular uh, social uh, organization you know it has now gone into oblivion. Nagas no longer produce uh, their beautiful wood carvings or beautiful beadwork or beautiful textile connected with this practice and that is uh, what happening in many other places it is not possible to cover in this lecture. So, uh, with this I think uh, uh, we can um, conclude this uh, lecture and just giving you some information. It is mm -hmm. not uh, the exhaustive, but very brief 
Thank you very much. Brief introductory and uh, characteristic feature of tribal and uh, folk art in India. So I hope, friends, uh, with this word we conclude, and I thank all of you for watching the lecture. And on behalf, I thank Dr. A.K. Das for giving such an insightful lecture on this very topic. Thank you very much.